I loved it to bits. I don't, don't know how else to put it, you know, I would have done anything for her. I'd happily change it. Um, I'd do anything to change, change what's happened, absolutely anything. He can't change it though. Tom Cappuccini's beloved wife, Frances, died. There was a botched caesarean, a breathing tube removed too soon in the operating theater, a failure to pick up blood poisoning. The list goes on. It's just, just surreal, you know, you keep running through every scenario in your head of this, this can't be happening, you know, this is, this is just a bad dream, I'm gonna wake up. It was four and a half years ago, and their second son had, after an emergency caesarean, been born. One of the best days of my life at that point. <laughs> um, and then you get all the congratulations, messages flooding in, and then obviously word of mouth spreads, so you get more friends that you haven't told directly, texting. That elation, as Tom describes it, was temporary. Frances, or Frankie as everyone called her, began to hemorrhage. She lost more than two litres of blood. They rushed her into surgery but she never came back. After the initial shock and the initial, um, has this happened, all the questions you get, what, what, how has this happened? There must be something else you can do. There can't be, she can't be dead, you know? After that, that initial thing and then having to deal with, I said, you know, congratulations text coming in, because by that point nobody knew what had gone on. It was just, it was so quick at that stage. Come on, it, fetch it. This is the first interview Tom has given since Frankie died at Tunbridge Wells Hospital. Yeah on October the 9th, 2012. The grief is etched in every line on his face. For more than four years, he has replayed what happened over and over. He's barely been able to work. At times, it's only because of the boys he's been able to carry on. It's taken a lot longer for me to be able to start grieving than, than I think it would have done in a normal situation. Um, also, the suddenness of it has a massive, massive impact, because like you say, you're not prepared for it at all. Why has it taken so long? Tom says medical records and notes were incomplete, illegible or withheld. The police had to go to court to get a document they needed. There was even a failed attempt to stop the second inquest. The trust made it very, very difficult to get any documentation of any kind, from witness statements to the serious investigation report to um, just anything. You know, it's infuriating because at the time, all I wanted to know was what the hell am I going to tell my children? What am I going to tell my family? The trust denies this and says they provided all documentation within 21 days. That mistakes were made throughout, however, is now clear. After a difficult first birth, for instance, Frankie had been booked in, this time, for an elective caesarean but she went into spontaneous labour and was encouraged to try naturally, a regret Tom still lives with. She was terrified. She knew, she, it was as if she knew all along um, that something was going to go wrong, which is why she was so insistent to me in the car on the way to the hospital about the, about the C-section. Um, and I've massively let her down there. After 12 hours, she had an emergency C-section and that is when the mistakes became catastrophic because, and nobody has ever answered how this happened, a large piece of placenta was left in and she began to bleed heavily. Taken back to surgery, Frankie was put under anaesthetic and never came round. Even when she was taken down to, um, uh, to the surgical units for, for that last time, you know, when she turned around to me, if anything happens, just look after the boys. Um, she knew even then, um, and I, I think I remember turning around to her and saying, "Don't be silly. You're going to be all right. Everything's going to be fine. We'll see you in 20 minutes." Um, and yeah, obviously that 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 never came to fruition. But even even then, she knew. At what point do you think you realised it had gone horribly wrong? Before I was told, definitely. I was I'd already phoned and texted my mum. Um, saying that she hasn't woken up and I, I, and I need her here and I don't think she's going to wake up. At which point I'm saying, oh, come on, she's under under good supervision. Um, it's a brand new hospital. Um, she's in the care of, of good doctors, um, which at the time set my mind at ease. And then, you know what, less than an hour later, they come in and tell me that she died. It was um, devastating. 
completely ripped, ripped me apart. I think my first reaction, I think I nearly passed out. I think I fell, fell on the floor. I think that's what, what happened initially. Um, and then, yeah, and then the next thing I kind of remember clearly is, is sort of the doctors going on about how they felt it must have been a reaction to general anaesthetic. But Tom says, as they walked down to see Frankie's body, another doctor warned him that serious questions needed answering. That was with certainly within an hour of her death, an hour and a half of the death. Um, I said the alarm bells had already started ringing by that point. Because um, I believe I'd already asked for medical notes by that point as well. An inquest would normally answer many of these questions. The first one in 2014, however, was stopped after the possibility of a verdict of unlawful killing was raised. And indeed, there was a landmark manslaughter case against the trust and two doctors. This man, Errol Cornish, the consultant anaesthetist on call that day. And Nadim Aziz, also an anaesthetist and the person responsible for Frankie in that second operation. But that trial collapsed and neither the trust nor the doctors were convicted. For those of us who saw you in court, I mean, you looked terrible, if you I don't didn't mind sleep. I didn't sleep for weeks. <laughs> I didn't sleep for weeks before it. I didn't sleep for weeks after it. Um, I've never been so emotionally and physically drained at that point. Um, it was, yeah, you know, there was a lot of pressure on myself, on the, fa on the whole family. In fact, my parents, my, my in-laws, um, we were all in the same boat. But I, I, I just had to keep going because this wasn't about me. This was about Frankie. It was about getting justice for her. And that justice of a sort did finally come in January. A new inquest was held, despite, it has to be said, a last-minute attempt by the Trust to stop it. Failures of Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust and those employed by the Trust cost Frankie her life. So what did happen? Quite simply and devastatingly, Dr Aziz had removed Frankie's breathing tube too soon, before she had come round from the anaesthetic. Then he told Dr Cornish she'd breathed on her own and moved her arms. This, the inquest found, was not true. But it meant there was a delay in putting the tube back in. There is no way in the time frame from when she was given the anaesthetic to when she allegedly started, started waking up, um, there's no way her, her body would have been able to metabolise it that quickly to start waking up. So, therefore, in his eyes and the other expert's eyes, um, Dr Aziz was not telling the truth to Dr Cornish when he came into the theatre. Dr Aziz has returned to Pakistan and was not at either of the inquests or the court case. I mean, a lot, a lot, I placed a lot of blame. I still do a lot of blame on myself for not being more forceful um, and more aggressive with midwives when I first got there and, and, and insisting more that we had the C-section. So to then, to then imagine her waking up and being unable to breathe by herself but being conscious at the time, for me, is, oh my God, I can't even... Can't even put into words how that made me feel. Uh, so to, to have them at the inquest tell me, no, there's no way she could have woken up is just, just taken so much off my shoulders. It had also emerged in the trial that Dr Aziz had been involved in a similar incident seven months before Frankie's death. The court was told that after that, he went on a course. There didn't appear to be any sort of record as to whether or not that had actually happened. And so um, that struck me as, as surprising. And, and where an organisation is, is focused on patient safety, it seemed to me pretty important that where you've got somebody who you know, has, has made an error and, and you know, I accept that errors do happen, um, but then it's not followed up with, by the way, have, you have done that course, haven't you? There's a record of it. I think that that's... It seemed to me quite a, a basic point. It was also finally confirmed that Frankie was suffering from sepsis, blood poisoning. But Tom only received the final test result two days after the end of the inquest and four and a half years after she died. And that was the one that showed um, the, the white blood cells and things increasing um, and other indicators that sepsis was present at that point. 
Um, and you know, for, for someone to pick that up and just go, well, that's that's the start of the sepsis. I, I, I don't understand how, out of all the doctors and all the nurses and all the midwives that were there that day, how not a single one of them was able to, to pick up on that, because to me, that's basic. A picture has built up of those 24 hours, of poor communication between staff, of problems with basic procedures. Dr Cornish, for instance, did not know he was responsible for supervising Dr Aziz. The inquest found that the hospital's arrangements for notifying the on-call anaesthetist were both unclear and inadequate. I think I'm 99.9% I'm, I'm .9 certain it, it started with the sepsis. Um, and then every event after that where things should have been picked up and should have been dealt with, unfortunately, mistakes were made all the way along. The trust would not be interviewed, but in a statement said they would again like to offer their deepest sympathies. We have acknowledged that Francis's death was avoidable and we have made significant changes as a direct result of the aspects of her care which did not meet the standards we would expect. The circumstances of Francis's death have been extensively explored. They also said the length of time it took to find out what happened was outside their control due to the legal proceedings. What comfort has drawn from this is vastly overshadowed by the loss of Frankie, a wife, a mother to two boys, a daughter. I don't think Frankie dying was avoidable. I think it's the wrong word to use. It wasn't avoidable, it was inevitable. Um, it was inevitable that somebody was going to die at the hospital. That has been made clear to me over the last four and a half years, over everything I've looked into, over everything that other people have looked into, the police and, and legal teams included. Um, someone was going to die. Um, it's just unfortunate. It happened to be us. That report was produced by Katie Brown and Victoria McDonald joins me right now. Victoria, that shattering, shattering interview. And one wonders, is it just an unfortunate one-off or is it something which has wider implications for the NHS? It was heartbreaking. Um, but what is often heartbreaking about these cases is the length of time. Now, this is one of the worst instances I've come across, but it does happen. Families have to fight and fight to get to the truth. Now, it is something about the system. It's not just the Trust's fault. It's something about the whole process. Following the Mid Staffordshire scandal, Sir Robert Francis said trusts have to be more open, more transparent, more candid. There is indeed a legal duty of candour. Uh, following this, the Health Secretary has also reiterated when he's talking about patient safety that there needs to be more transparency. Trusts have to hold up, up their hands more often. But there is something, as I said, in the system, within the NHS, that often makes them not not able to put their hands up immediately, not able to take that pain away or explain. Now, it could be that it's the lawyers telling them not to do it, or it could be that they don't know how to investigate it themselves or what they should say. The consequences are this, that, they, that a family can spend four years having to go over and over and over what happened. Now, every single family I have ever interviewed under these circumstances says the same thing. It never wavers. They are not after money or whatever for this. All they ever want to know is what happened and they want it to not happen to anybody else.